I guess uh, I'm going to start out obviously with the past and there's some, I'm going to choose some arbitrary dates that I consider uh, the beginning of the past, the present, and the future. But let's go all the way back to 18, the 1800s for digital logic design where we come across George Boole. George Boole was a mathematician who wrote two very influential papers. Uh, the first one was called Mathematical Analysis of Logic. It was written in 1847. The second is An Investigation of the Laws of Thought on which are founded the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities from 1854. A paper with a fairly long title and both papers really didn't gain a huge amount of recognition at the time. And even George Boole himself thought that these were interesting papers, but saw no major ramifications from them. It really wasn't until Claude Shannon, uh, in the 1930s, rediscovered Boole, along with some other people. Uh, Claude Shannon was a, a, an electrical engineering student at MIT, and he wrote what is considered one of the most important master's theses in electrical engineering of all time. It was called A Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits. What Claude Shannon was able to do, uh, and that was in 1938, by the way, uh, what Claude Shannon was able to do, which I consider remarkable, is that he was able to take Boolean logic and Boolean algebra and apply it to digital circuitry. Up until that time, uh, well, up until that time, there really wasn't any significant digital circuitry, but that was about the beginning of uh, the computer age. Computers, uh, some people had started dabbling in digital computers, digital electronic computers, I should say. And World War II really brought that effort to the forefront where computers were used as calculating machines. They were used as very fast calculators to calculate the trajectories of missiles. Uh, unfortunately, the first, uh, what's considered the first modern digital computer, ENIAC, really wasn't uh, completed until after World War II. And uh, the, what I consider the first digital computer by John Adden Nassov uh, actually was uh, at Iowa State University, was unfortunately dismantled before a lot of people knew about it. But from that point onward, digital computers, as I said, were calculating machines until Claude Shannon's paper uh, was recognized by some of the uh, um, luminaries in the field of digital computing. And that combined with the work of Alan Turing, a British mathematician who came up with the idea of state machines, uh, got people to realize that computers could be much more than simply calculating machines, but they could also be control machines, that they could do more than just crunch numbers, they could control any kind of hardware. So the the idea of that dates back to George Boole and, uh, and then later Claude Shannon. On my next slide, you see what might arguably be the very first digital schematic. This is a schematic for a combination lock, a digital circuit for a combination lock that was drawn by Claude Shannon in his famous master's thesis. And obviously looks a lot different than any of the schematics, at least digital schematics, that we would draw these days. This next slide shows what we, you probably recognize as the standard uh, symbols for digital logic design. We have the, uh, on the right hand side, you'll see the symbol for the AND gate, OR gate, the inverter, the NAND, the NOR, the exclusive OR, and the exclusive NOR. On the left side, you'll see some of the standards that have been developed uh, by ANSI and, and the IEEE, two standards bodies, to uh, uh, standardize these symbols. And these symbols are what digital electronic engineers have used for many, many years, uh, starting since the standardization, at least in 1973. Now, I remember when I got out of school, the engineer's job was to draw these symbols, to draw circuits using these symbols onto a piece of paper, and it would be very rough, lots of erasures, lots of crossing out. And we would then hand the uh, drawings to a drafter, who would very carefully draft these schematics and make something that looked much nicer than something that we had created. And an example of one of those is on the next slide. We see a page of schematics from the Apollo guidance computer in 1967. 
This was the computer in the Apollo space capsule that uh, took care of uh, much of the controls inside the capsule. Now, I remember, in, again, in those days, there was a lot of, in my opinion, inefficiency uh, due to the fact that I would draw a schematic and hand it to a drafter. The drafter would redraw it. There would be miscommunications. Uh, he or she couldn't understand my scribbles, and so things would come back incorrect. Hopefully, I discover that before the circuit was assembled, but sometimes not. And there'd be a lot of uh, back and forth between me and the drafter. So then, what I still consider the, to be the past, uh, systems came about in the early 80s, schematic capture systems. And these were systems that, uh, whereby there were workstations that uh, had graphic software with a mouse and a graphical display. These were fairly unique at the time, this concept of graphical user interfaces. And these companies created systems whereby an engineer could simply draw the schematics on the computer. Everything would then be laid out very, very nicely and could be annotated nicely. And a database could be created from that in order to create a physical device, typically a um, circuit board and later a uh, integrated circuit. The companies that you see on the slide are CAE Systems, DAISY Systems, Mentor Graphics, and Valid Logic Systems. Those were four of the early pioneers of these systems. The next slide shows an example of a schematic that was drawn on one of these systems. And uh, two things I'd like to point out. I remember that in the early days, I mentioned, uh, I was really out of, I came out of school when these systems started gaining acceptance. And I worked with some older engineers who were uh, not used to schematic capture, not even used to entering, even though they, they may have designed computers, they weren't used to entering information into computers, specifically graphic information. And I remember working with one uh, older gentleman who was very upset at the whole uh, schematic capture movement because he told me that it wasn't his job to draw schematics and make them look nice. Uh, it was his job to think, create the logic, and then give it to a drafter to make it clean. And now with schematic capture systems, he had to worry about where, where is the placement, what is the size, how does the thing look. I had a different opinion, and, and eventually most of the industry did. And that opinion was that schematic capture systems, although they, although they took more training, to understand beyond my electrical engineering training. It also made, uh, eliminated the communication errors that occurred between me and a drafter. And essentially, it gave me full control over the design, which meant that I could make changes instantly, look at them, see if they were correct, they weren't correct, correct them. Now, you'll notice that uh, of the companies that I've mentioned, there's only one company that survives today, and that's Mentor Graphics. Uh, Mentor Graphics survived because of their business model. Companies, CAE Systems, Valid Logic Design, and DAISY all decided that they were going to manufacture their own workstations. And these workstations uh, were going to be very powerful and have powerful schematic capture tools and other tools that are now known as EDA, Electronic Design Automation Tools. Uh, their thinking, I believe, is that by designing hardware workstations in addition to software, they could, char they could have full control over the entire system, and they could have uh, higher profit margins. Hardware often has very high profit margins. At that time, hardware had, uh, often had higher profit margins than software, because the software is very specialized. But the hardware can be uh, increasingly designed with cheaper components, and the price uh, uh, remain high, because people are willing to pay a lot of money for hardware. That was the thing. Mentor, on the other hand, said that we will leave the hardware design to someone else. That our specialty is creating the tools not that run on the hardware, that run on the workstation, not the hardware itself. And it turned out that that ended up being a better model. They ported their tools to a company called Apollo that made workstations that was later bought by Hewlett Packard. But what it meant is that the workstations could be general purpose. It means workstations were not uh, limited to EDA, not limited to 
engineers who are designing hardware who need schematic capture. The workstations created by Apollo could go to engineers doing software development, engineers doing mechanical development, engineers doing physical layout development, and even non-engineers. These could be used in accounting departments. And so the, the market, by not limiting these workstations, the market was much larger and also Mentor had less risk in that they could always take their software and port it to other machines. So again, Mentor has flourished somewhat. They're now one of the big EDA companies, the big three, and the other companies have unfortunately disappeared.